Hi, Mark. Mark Ford, or Michael Masterson, doesn't really need a whole lot of introduction from me. Mark has been involved in direct response for 40 plus years, correct? That's right. He has been involved with selling every product from a financial newsletter to health supplements to TVs to Chinese tchotchkes to pretty much anything you can possibly imagine under the sun. He, over the course of career, has mainly driven hundreds of different entrepreneurial endeavors by mainly copywriting and knowing about copywriting and understanding persuasion and its role in advertising and using that to not only found businesses on new or unique ideas, but also grow them as well, such as Agora is just one of many examples. Everybody probably knows him as uh, Michael Masterson, uh, originally a blogger who founded Early to Rise and the writer of books that pretty much is on everybody's must read list when it comes to entrepreneurship and copywriting like Persuasion, Architecture of Persuasion, uh, Copy Logic, Great Leads, Ready Fire Aim, Automatic Wealth. I think I've gotten a third of those books. I wanted to kick it over to Mark and first start off with, uh, you know, what did I miss from your brag sheet? Because I know I did. And then also, I'd love to kick into a conversation about what originally drew you to direct response and how did you get started in this business so many years ago? Great. Okay, Sean, thank you for that uh, introduction. There are a lot of people that are my age in the industry and started as I did in the direct mail days and uh, went on to uh, continue in whatever niche of the business they were in. But the advantage I had in being in so many different businesses is that I was kind of a force to try to understand, I think, um, consumer psychology in, uh, you know, in a very basic way, because um, whether you're buying a, uh, a watch or a, a purebred dog or a financial newsletter or a health supplement, the actual uh, workings, the internal workings of the, of the mind, you know, are pretty much the same. Uh, and, and you don't really f figure that out until later. I'm sorry, my, my, I'm going to try to get my granddaughters out of here. They, they've got a uh, whoopee cushion that they're playing with. So uh, just give me one second. Guys, oh, good. I was worried that you were pulling a Rudy Giuliani for a moment. Guys, I'm sorry. I have to, I have to do this by myself. Can you go outside, please? <laughs> they won't go inside. I'm going to get their parents. Now, Liam, yeah. could you please bring girls inside? I'm doing an interview outside. They, they were entertaining the uh, listeners with whoopee cushion sounds. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that what I've done is uh, working with writers is, you know, there's the architecture of persuasion, which is something that can be learned and it's pretty consistent. And there's been a lot of great books written uh, since I started writing about it. The elements of persuasion, it still kind of surprises me when I work with copywriters today that they're there's still a big um, disconnect often between what they think they need to say to uh, sell a product or an idea and uh, what I think that they need to say, which, uh, which involves keeping a close track on your, your reader's um, thoughts, feelings, and beliefs about the product that you're selling. So I did have that advantage, I think, and I've, I've worked, as you said, with hundreds of small companies and some very large companies. And so... I was, I've been able to at least come up with some theories that seem to work for me, regardless of who am I working for and what industry. Sort of launching off of what you just touched on there with the disconnect that is, I think, readily apparent in a lot of copy today, especially those that are promulgated through ads and channels and such that really, I think, touch on but more desperate people, people looking for magic buttons, simple fixes, get rich quick schemes, the kind of people who are probably not the best, most qualified buyers. I am very interested in the kinds of emotions that you're talking about and the kinds of things and claims that you think copy should be making in order to reach a better qualified customer and also appear, how should I say, more ethical in the eyes of the law. One of the, th the approaches I've been taking lately, rather than making your goal the, the, the highest revenue or the, the largest profit or the, the greatest number of buyers, make your goal the 
highest lifetime value of your customers. Of course, after that, you're going to try to uh, have good revenues or good products. But if you make that your primary goal, uh, what you're going to get is a business that has long-term stability because you will be forced to look for, as you said, high quality customers rather than taking anybody that's willing to walk in the door and then trying to do everything you can to get them to work over as much money for your products as you can. So this is a very fundamental difference uh, in terms of approach. What that means is that if you, if you focus on that, there are a lot of things that you will not be able to do. You'll not be able to uh, write get rich quick stuff because it doesn't appeal to intelligent people. And generally, if you're talking about wealthy people who have big pockets and who won't mind paying for the more expensive versions of whatever it is that you're selling them, that kind of copy turns them off and makes them suspicious. What does LTV or lifetime value mean? Why is it important for a direct response business? And what are some of the ways that you found to maximize it? Uh, LTV means lifetime value. In the direct response business, we track everything. We track all our customers' sales and so on and, uh, until from when they start until when hopefully they die or they leave us for some other reason. And the idea of lifetime value is that uh, the goal is not to get the most money that you can from them in the shortest amount of time, but to develop a relationship with them that is good for both of you so that they continue to buy products from you happily without uh, very low refund rates and do that over a longish period of time, 10 or 20 years or what have you, rather than just one or two years. I would say most small businesses work on a year by year profit basis and just do everything they can to extract the max amount of dollars uh, uh, over a single year. And that just leads to a lot of bad ideas about marketing that aren't necessarily wrong if you have a one-year perspective. And that's the difficult part about persuading some people to take this approach that I'm talking about, is that they know and they've been taught and they've seen that uh, by using uh, get-rich-quick type of strategies and language, you can attract a lot of people and make a lot of money, but they're, they're gonna be coming in and there's a big churn rate when you do that. That's the idea of focusing on lifetime value. What are some of the methods that you found for I guess, product creation to increase lifetime value, and also the relationship building, which I think is very crucial for copywriters. You know, in the old days, the direct mail days, um, every time you communicated with a, a customer or a potential customer, it cost you 50 cents. So back in those days, the business that I was a partner in, we had about a million customers. So every time we sent them anything, it cost us a half a million dollars, even an invoice. And so we were mandated to try to sell them something every time we contacted them. And that created a kind of, a, you know, a, a, not adversarial, but it created a, a, a kind of relationship that was, let's just say from their point of view, pushy. The great thing about the internet is that the cost of contacting a customer or a pr pr prospective customer is now much less than a penny. In the old days, we might have been in touch with our customers 20 times a year. Uh, now we can be in touch with them typically 500 times a year. And that allows you to spend a lot of time talking to them, asking them questions, getting their response, having real conversations that turn into real relationships based on what they want, what they're worried about, what they're concerned, how you can help them. That allows for uh, a relationship that's much stronger. And if you do take advantage of that, you try to build a relationship, but by again, just focusing on the customer's needs, wants, and desires, beliefs, concerns, fears, et cetera, you can be of better service to him and develop that longer term relationship. And the customer will feel grateful. He'll notice the difference between that and the other kind of marketing and will appreciate it and will pay you back through his loyalty. And also what it means is once you've developed that relationship, you don't have to sell as hard. The way you should sell once you've developed that relationship is by recommendation. I, I often say this when I'm, I'm coaching people in the health business. They'll often write copy for doctors that's like almost like a carnival bark or, you know, this is the number one thing. You, if you don't listen to, to me, everything's going to fall apart and, and you've got to do this. And if a doctor, if my doctor ever spoke to me that way, I would be very nervous. You know, I, I, what I want my doctor to do is have a very common, rational voice to show me that he's done his homework and to make recommendations that are 
that seem restrained and more reserved. I notice in junior copywriters a lot of hyperbole as well. There's two reasons for that. I think it's because there's, to a certain degree, a lack of empathy. If all you can understand of your prospect is what they fear and what they're greedy about, then that's naturally going to lead you to claims that are, by their very nature, hyperbolic. And I was wondering if you could perhaps talk about that. In the old days, uh, they say that uh, fear and greed is the only emotions that matter and you should focus on those. But I, I don't think by any stretch, uh, fear and greed are the more most important emotions in selling for any number of reasons. One of which is that people don't wanna see themselves as being fearful or greedy. And so when you're pressing that button too hard or too often, you're making your customer very uncomfortable that you may get a reaction from them, a reaction that you're looking for, but um, you're putting them into a state of discomfort that I think deteriorates the relationship over the long term. There are so many other emotions that to me matter more. Emotions like curiosity, for example, like um, aspiration, embarrassment, and shame. These are emotions that are you know, extremely important that affect our decisions about what we're gonna do and not do. The copywriter, to me, the, the more masterful copywriter is a person that's completely aware of that. You've got to have a sensitivity to the full spectrum of a person's emotions and respond to those. And if you do, you're gonna get better results and a better customer and a better relationship.